Good afternoon. Welcome. Um, I'm Cheryl Feldman, uh, and I'm so proud to be here and be part of this discussion and really excited to talk, uh, to really be able to do a little bit more of a deep dive. So I hope that as I'm asking questions of the panelists that people in the audience would also feel free to say, I really want to know about this. Um, so jump in. Um, the other thing that I thought we would do is to go around the room and if you could just say your name and who you work for and your role, um, and if you've ever engaged in any apprenticeship initiatives, just so we have a sense of the audience. So if you'd like to start, that would be so wonderful. Oh, and when you speak, you have to hit the mic. Okay. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? My name is Danella Abdul-Barr, and I'm the CEO and founding president of Families Achieving Success Together. We're probably the only community-based organization here, it looks like. Um, but the cool thing about it is my role, I'm a pharmacist by training. So I think all of the things that um, was talked about in terms of practical experience related to healthcare, I'm very aware of the apprenticeship piece. You can't become a pharmacist without it. So. Yeah. Hi, everybody. My name is Steve Russell. I am the business services supervisor at the Montgomery County Career Link. Uh, so we're in the neighboring county. I am also an apprentice. I am with the Apprenticeship Navigators program as well and uh, excited to be a part of everything. So. Hi, uh, my name is Christine Boone Hackett. I am a apprenticeship coordinator with Jeff's Human Services, and I'm actually in the same program that he's in as an apprenticeship navigator. Um, so I'm an apprentice running an apprenticeship program <laughs> for medical assistants. Um, a, a little bit of my background is I was a medical assistant for about 10 years. Um, when I heard about the job with Jeff's and um, apprenticeships in um, training medical assistants on, on the, getting them, giving them on the job training. I was very excited because I know what it is to come out of school as a medical assistant and to um, have difficulty finding a job if you don't have any type of experience. So um, it's grown into a passion. I, I found my passion um, with this program. So I'm very excited to learn about healthcare apprenticeships and how I can help the medical assistants in the field. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Phil Brooks. Um, I am the director of STEM Workforce Partnerships at the University City Science Center. Um, this is a new role for me, but I'm coming from uh, the Office of Workforce Development with the City of Philadelphia, uh, primarily focusing on um, STEM youth engagement. Um, so a lot of my current role right now um, is connecting West Philadelphia residents to opportunities within the STEM field, and that can mean a lot of different things healthcare, technology, engineering, math, um, really focusing on uh, folks with four, um, less than a four-year degree. Um, so working closely with partners like the West Philadelphia Skills Initiative, Wistar Institute, um, Community College uh, Philadelphia, a few other folks, um, but really like cracking the nut on making sure that adults within that region who are very intelligent, very bright, very uh, apt at you know doing things on a very efficient level, um, have those opportunities to connect with uh, STEM uh, careers and um, STEM opportunities, including apprenticeships. Hi, my name is John Sarno, and I'm president of the Employers Association of New Jersey. Uh, EANJ is a uh, trade association comprised of um, 3,500 employers in, in the state. Um, it, it, we, rep, we represent every imaginable um, employer, small, mom and pop, all the way up to some major, uh, major corporate firms. Uh, we spend most of our time really on um, helping uh, employers manage their workforces, HR issues, legal issues. But um, uh, over the last few years, really, since you might might know that our governor, Governor Murphy, was the ambassador to Germany. <clears throat> and while he was ambassador to Germany, he really um, was really immersed in the whole, uh, the apprenticeship system, but, but also as a matter of culture too. Um, we don't have it in our DNA here as, mm -hmm. as we're hearing today. Uh, but nevertheless, um, 
the governor and uh, Rob Angelo, the commissioner, uh, who, who's, who's right here, um, have been uh, champions, avatars for apprenticeship in New Jersey. So we're just trying to do our part. So it's funny that John mentioned DNA because I'm a geneticist by training. Um, but I'm currently the uh, Associate Dean of Biomedical Studies at the Wistar Institute. And the way I got to Wistar was I was a faculty member at Community College of Philadelphia in a partnership that the Wistar Institute had with Community College of Philadelphia to train uh, students to become biomedical research assistants. And so that program is in its uh, 20th year, and uh, now it is an official pre-apprenticeship to an extended apprenticeship. Um, WISTAR really wants to be more involved in uh, apprenticeships for different levels um, in the biomedical research space, which is really important um, for Philadelphia since we are med and ed and scientific research is the bridge between the two. Good afternoon, my name is Wanda Carlo. I'm, I'm the site administrator for CareerLink North. Um, I am just interested on, on seeing how we can help our customers take advantage of these apprenticeships because one of the, um, it's, it's hard to see someone that really wants to do something and because of the requirements, they cannot uh, go into the field. So um, we need to think about ways how to bridge that gap between the skills and the literacy levels and what are the requirements for the apprenticeships. Jay Adams, community head worker, Philadelphia Fight. Um, if y'all was in the other room, y'all know yep. who I am. And I'll, if for the interest of time, I'll pass the mic. My name's Nathan Kramer. I'm the principal of a shared time vocational school in Freehold, New Jersey. It's for special needs students. Uh, I'm just interested in creating in, uh, apprenticeships, stackable credentials, giving my students a leg up to enter the workforce. Rob Angelo, Commissioner of Labor in New Jersey. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Yasmin Hines, uh, representing the Net America Corporation. Um, we are a youth apprenticeship intermediary. Um, contracted by the U.S. DOL at the federal level, um, and we are focusing on healthcare apprenticeships um, in, in the you know with the youth in the regions of New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Maryland, D.C., and Northern Virginia. So I'm here to meet all of you, um, find synergies, and uh, find out how to help employers expand their their programs, create new career pathways in this arena. Um, and, and contribute where we can. So, thank you. Hello, I'm Tim Lidke, and I'm an actuary. And um, uh, in my past, I, was, I headed up KPMG's National Health Actuarial Practice. And our profession has been very, very well, serves the, the insurance industry really well. Uh, but we haven't really broken beyond that. And I think there's a lot of opportunities, especially as healthcare has changed through the Affordable Care Act and such to bring in um, some of our skill set to help with with healthcare as they go through accountable care organizations and, and a lot of risk-based programs. And so I'm interested in seeing how we can make actuarial apprentices um, happen. Hello, I am Tamika Nicole Jordan. I am the Workforce Initiatives Program Manager at Amera Health Caritas, which is an Independence Blue Cross Medicare managed care company. Um, where our headquarters is in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. We was we were birthed out of Mercy Hospital, right on 53rd and Cedar. Um, currently, we operate in 13 states. My role is to create workforce initiatives that we can replicate across our enterprise. And so I've done that, and now I'm looking at bridging the gap between those workforce programs and expanding them to include Apprentice as an HR opportunity for pipelining. 
Hi, I'm Susan Thomas, and uh, I actually retired at the end of June. <laughs> but I thank you. Um, after 43 years of lots of work, uh, I am still working on apprenticeship projects, um, both with Cheryl, uh, running the training fund, and also uh, with a school-based program for medical assistance um, that has a pre-apprenticeship and an apprenticeship. So nice to see everybody. Hi, I'm Melissa Eckstein. I'm a district career facilitator for a 7 to 12 traditional high school in South Jersey. Um, we place about 30 interns a year out of our 1 to 50 graduating class and about uh, 60 more in school to work programs. In Spirit Biota Hospice, uh, Penn Vet Working Dog Center, and Nemours DuPont are some of the places that take our interns, but we are looking to develop a program, um, which is why I'm interested in this. Um, we have a nurse that became a teacher. I don't know why she wanted the pay cut, but she did. And um, we're developing medical assistant programs using house paws, mobile vet service, um, and things like that to get creative and get young students interested in the world of healthcare. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Luke Ryan. I um, work with the Delaware Department of Education. I oversee CTE and STEM programs in grades, uh, grades K through 12, and then I also oversee kind of our short and long-term credential registered apprenticeship and two-year degree system at the post-secondary level. And I think we had one more person. Would you like to introduce? Okay, sure. <laughs> hey, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Nick Toth. I'm the director of the New Jersey Office of Apprenticeship. I'm interested in healthcare apprenticeships because it's uh, one of the key industry focuses that we have uh, with some of our grant programs, including our federal expansion grant that we received from USDOL. Uh, and we're hopefully going to kick off our first nurse residency uh, registered apprenticeship program in the state. So being here, hopefully hearing uh, best practices and to help instruct our strategy uh, moving forward is going to be something that will be, be very beneficial to the state. Well, thank you all for being here. Um, I'm going to do a little uh, opening uh, first, um, and then introduce the panelists and, and begin kind of a, a deeper dive into, uh, as you said, lessons learned, best practices. Um, so actually, Susan, who retired, and myself started the first apprenticeship program at the training fund in 2014 um, with community health worker. Um, and uh, from there, we were able to grow. So right now we have 150 apprentices um, working in a variety of occupations, um, health care, human services, and early child care education, which I'd like to speak to you a little bit about because I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, and for me, I've been in workforce for over 40 years. This has been a game changer. Apprenticeship has absolutely been a game changer. Um, we um, really have uh, been on a trajectory from transactional employer relationships where you train folks and you have a relationship with an employer and you place your students in a job to just deep working partnerships with employers where we design our programs together and we, we you know, vet our apprentices together and support them together and um, uh, cry on each other's shoulders when we need to and, and also uh, celebrate. Um, and that is all the difference because the relationship with the employers is key. I think Dr. Lehrman spoke today uh, about the fact that what makes apprenticeship different is the on-the-job learning. Um, and that's hard for educators to grasp because uh, post-secondary institutions are used to kind of saying what it is, laying down the law as to what's required. And uh, in an apprenticeship program, that, um, that kind of focus has to open up to embrace on the job learning as an as important as it is as important as what is happening in the classroom if not more um, and what we have done in our programs is to align the on the job learning with the classroom learning so that it's not that they're on two different tracks but they're integrated so 
in the best of all possible worlds when students are studying in a certain course, the on-the-job competencies that they're doing on the job are aligned with that coursework. So they can apply what they're learning on the job in the classroom and they can apply what's in the classroom to the job experience. And that makes it so rich and so different than even a clinical pharmacy experience. The other big piece is that as you've heard today, it's mentored. So in our case, we require a one-on-one -on -one mentor where there is at least one person totally assigned to that apprentice. Um, and uh, we require weekly meetings uh, where there is uh, assessment of competencies, um, where it's documented, and where we have an opportunity to not only develop the apprentice, but also to develop the mentor. And that's where, for me, the rubber hits the road with the employers because it's a double benefit of not only raising the, the leadership and um, competency of the apprentice, but also of the uh, mentor. I can't tell you how many of our mentors have gone back to school themselves now because they've just been inspired by the experience. Um, the other piece that has been very important to our model is credentialing. Um, and there is a difference between credentials and degrees. Um, I had the honor of uh, presenting on apprenticeship to uh, Chairman Powell of the Federal Reserve Board in Washington. And uh, it, we had a, there were four of us, and we had a whole discussion about the importance of credentials. Um, and for me, if a person finishes an apprenticeship program and they also do not get credentials associated with that apprenticeship, then you are holding that person back in terms of the portability of their skill sets. And so uh, we uh, were, have worked very hard to ensure that our apprenticeship programs have credentials, not just industry-recognized credentials, but collegiate credentials as well, um, so that uh, the apprentices can feel that they're on a pathway themselves, that they're not tied to just that one job with that one employer but that they have the ability as a result of the apprenticeship program to open up an entire pathway for themselves. Um, we see an apprenticeship as not the be all and end all, but it's one of our important strategies in building pipelines. And um, that's another big focus of our work that the apprenticeship is not seen as kind of just a point in time that goes away after the apprenticeship program, but that we have pipeline opportunities, pre-apprenticeship and others, into the apprenticeship, but then that there be pipeline opportunities following the apprenticeship program. That could be employer-based, where there are promotional opportunities, or it could be educationally based. Um, and Raymond Lockhart, an, uh, an apprentice on our panel today, uh, uh, works for uh, Philadelphia Mental Health Care Corporation. Shanae uh, represented uh, this employer uh, over the lunchtime panel. Jael um, is a lead in leadership of PMHCC. And in the Addictions Counselor Apprenticeship Program for Incumbent Workers, the workers are getting a um, drug and alcohol certification recognized by the state of Pennsylvania, you have to pass an exam. So they're getting college credits through Penn State and the ability to get this credential that then puts them on a path to higher level credentials. The other piece of our pipeline strategy, and this may or may not apply to all of you, but it's, it's very endemic to our work, is that we are very cognizant of recognizing the importance of social determinants mm -hmm. that are impacting 
our students, and our workplaces. We're very aware of the systemic barriers that prevent many, many people in Philadelphia from accessing good jobs and also prevent even incumbent workers to raise to leadership positions. And we have issues of um, diversity and racial inclusion that are at play. Uh, we have issues of very severe poverty in Philadelphia. Um, and we can't run an apprenticeship program in a vacuum. It's not a vacuum. It represents what's going on in our society. And, and so for us, the apprenticeship program is part of a larger strategy in our mind of impacting those systemic barriers and impacting our ability to, uh, to change um, our workplaces and our communities. Um, so I'd like to speak briefly about multi-employer um, partnerships that was discussed earlier. Um, Philadelphia Fight has a single employer apprenticeship program. Um, one employer, uh, one occupation, community health worker. Um, and that's wonderful. And they do a great job. Um, the other model, though, is to recruit and organize multiple employers in the same industry to come together and really see the apprenticeship as an industry intervention, as a way for employers to address their, um, uh, the barriers that they have in, in recruiting talent and keeping talent. And so um, I've become a big believer in multi-employer apprenticeships. It's, it's not, doesn't have to be the case, but for us, we really work hard to make that possible. And we form apprenticeship committees of those employers. We have union employers. We have non-union employers. We happen to be union-based, but um, SPIN that Lucy represents special people in the Northeast happens to be a union-based employer. PMHCC <coughs> is not. But they're in the same apprenticeship committee together, working together, and really addressing uh, the needs of the apprenticeship program. And for us, that's like, that's our sweet spot. That's where we can really make change and really, uh, really try to impact what's going on in the industry uh, with employers uh, really leading and driving, uh, driving that work. So um, we have created and continue to create a number of occupationally based apprenticeship programs. Um, we have a number in the healthcare industry, um, in human services. Uh, we've done opportunity youth apprentice with our direct support professional pre-apprentice to apprenticeship program. Um, we uh, also uh, have done both new hire apprenticeship programs as well as incumbent. We're talking to a major hospital system in Philadelphia about a RN apprenticeship as we speak and hope that we'll be launching that. Um, uh, but I do have to take one minute to talk about early child care because it's become a real passion <coughs> of mine. And even if you're not in early child care, you should be aware because what do our workers need in order to come to work to every day of their parents? They need daycare. It's not daycare. It's child care. It's early childhood education. They need quality early childhood education. And we've been lucky enough in Philadelphia to have a soda tax that funds universal pre-K. Um, but we started with an amazing associate degree apprenticeship taking frontline child care workers who make very little money. Uh, to the associate degree at CCP. We now have, I think, 66 childcare apprentices at CCP, um, a lot. Um, and 
we now are finishing the, well, we're starting the pipeline at the high school level now with a pre-apprenticeship, and we're finishing up at Arcadia University in Montgomery County with a bachelor's in, a, in uh, early childhood education. And we've taken this model, and now we're doing it statewide. So we have seven regional hubs around our state where we are implementing a similar model of um, pre-apprenticeship to associate to bachelor's degree. Um, colleges are giving free college credit for up to nine credits and more of on-the-job learning as part of the apprenticeship program. It has been a systems change piece in the state of Pennsylvania, and we are so thankful to Governor Wolf, to Eric Ramsey, who you heard speak, um, to really taking this innovation to another level. Um, so I want to just mention that because in terms of building capacity of apprenticeship programs, you know, it's the difference between having wonderful apprentices, you know, 10 at one employer and four at another and one at another to statewide creating hundreds of apprenticeship programs. And so that's what, what we're doing in early childhood. It's definitely a replicable, mo replicable model. The other thing before I uh, stop and turn it over to the panelists is um, that there is a lot of funding right now available for apprenticeships. So if you're sitting here and wanting to start an apprenticeship program or grow your apprenticeship program, there's a lot of funding opportunities. So Net America has a U.S. Department of Labor grant. I'm part of a health care, a national health care um, coalition of labor management uh, uh, with a group called HCAP, and we are implementing apprenticeship programs all across the United States in healthcare uh, with USDOL money. I think right now we have two USDOL grants as part of that uh, initiative. Um, the Urban Institute, Rob Lehrman is part of the Urban Institute, they have apprenticeship money. Um, Net America is for young adults yes. and uh, uh, and so is um, Urban Institute. And then Jobs for the Future has money, and I'm involved as a, um, a coach in their program. They have money from USDOL to establish uh, apprenticeship programs for opportunity youth. That's 18 to 24. So if you want to start an apprenticeship program and you're looking for funding, there is a lot of funding out there right now at a national level that you can tap into. And I wanted to say that because my last point is apprenticeship programs is not the bottom of the road, low cost program. If you do apprenticeship right, it costs money. The intermediary needs money to navigate the setup and support the ongoing implementation. You need money for the post-secondary or RTI, the related technical instruction. You need money for the coaches to support them. Um, it, it costs money to run an apprenticeship program. So uh, having support from an organization that's being funded by USDOL is uh, something that uh, you can certainly take advantage to support the work you want to do. Um, so with that, we get to the meat of the program. And uh, just a time check, we have about 50 minutes. The way that I've designed it is to have each of the panelists just give a very quick opening, letting you know what their background is. Um, and then from there, I will start out with a list of questions, but welcome you to jump in as you think of questions. Just jump right in. So I will start with Lucy, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lucy Corker, and I am a Native American. <laughs> ha, ha, ha. Um, I come from Great Britain. I grew up in North Wales, and uh, when I was 25, I decided to come to America for 18 months, and that was a long time ago. <laughs> um, I am the Director of Professional Development for SPIN, Special People in the Northeast, SPIN is a non-profit organization that provides lifespan services 
to people with developmental disabilities, intellectual disabilities and autism. And it also celebrates its 50th anniversary this year. So we're matching <laughs> the spin. Um, I have worked in the professional development department for 18 years. I started um, as a direct support professional, which is what our one of our two apprenticeship programs is in, and I've been the director for seven years. My job is to make sure that all um, that we are compliant with all training regulations um, because we are funded by the government. Um, so I have four programs that we are responsible for, and the residential adult services program is where our apprenticeship sits for BHT. We also have a children's services program, and SPIN has the uh, very first national registered early childhood educator apprenticeship um, within its midst as well. Um, so I have eight BHT apprentices, five have graduated to journey work, four have graduated to journey worker last summer. And I currently have three who are active apprentices in the BHT program. I have five ECE apprentices, early childhood, early childhood apprentices. Four have graduated, one will graduate this summer. And three of the four that graduated, has chose, they have chosen to move on to the bachelor's apprenticeship program. So we're super, super excited for, that, for all of that. Um, what is my role at SPIN with the leadership, with apprenticeship program? It is the leadership piece of it. It was my job. Judy Dodsman, our executive director, asked me, told me, asked me nicely, oh. to bring apprenticeship programs to SPIN. Um, and I very eagerly did so, and I am in love with apprenticeship programs. It's, they're absolutely fantastic. It's super hard work, um, but it's very, very meaningful and um, very fulfilling. So I set up a structured program so that we could make sure that the apprenticeship program was successful, finding mentors, um, talking to the managers, um, bringing a whole team of about 30 people to the table to help me navigate and figure out how apprenticeship programs were going to work at SPIN. Um, yep. So Thank you, Lucy. Me. Thank you. And this is Jael Delva uh, from PMHCC, Philadelphia Mental Health Care Corporation. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Jael. I am the Compliance and Quality Assurance Officer for PMACC Case Management. I have been with uh, the DSP apprenticeship with Cheryl for three years and also our addictions counselor apprenticeship for going on a year now. Um, so my background, I was a young adult case manager straight out of college working with young adults who are newly diagnosed with chronic mental health disorders and um, medical situations, a lot of folks in the judicial system as well. So I did case management for seven years. And through my tenure, I realized early on that uh, my passion wasn't necessarily the frontline work. It was the behind the scenes policy uh, business aspect and the uh, development piece of human interaction. So I went, I, I went back, got my master's in business, and uh, became a compliance officer for a drug and alcohol case management department. And um, it's through my tenure there that I realized uh, human resource development itself was my passion. So I went back to school and got a, another master's. And at that time, Cheryl came knocking at our door and she caught, she caught us on a good day. Um, <laughs> our director, um, you know, it was, it's unheard of, it was unheard of to have an apprenticeship program within the behavioral health field. So his approach was, well, 
if you want to do it, do it. I'm like, yes, I want to do it. I'm going to mm-hmm. do it. We're going to create this job description. We're going to make it work. I'm going to figure out the the um, the role of the, these individuals, and we're going to go with it. And, you know, I'm, I'm really glad that he gave me the, the free range to do that because the apprenticeship has really been – uh, a passion of mine and a passion of our organization. We've seen some some really uh, stressful situations turn into some beautiful things, and um, it's also been uh, several aha moments for us because you know. And Cheryl said this is a lot of work, and it's you know it's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. And with that, you as an employer, we need to be okay with evaluating our current operations. And, and adapting to the operations that we need to be doing in order for this to work. So uh, this apprenticeship has really been, uh, well, both apprenticeships have really helped our organization become stronger and also build that loyalty that employers need because we all know onboarding and hiring and firing, it all costs money. And if we're able to get someone, grow them, empower them, and, and watch them grow within the organization, it really helps with the longevity of, of the unit. So that's why I'm here. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. And Raymond Lockhart is an apprentice, current apprentice, will graduate in May uh, in addictions counseling, working at PMHCC. Good afternoon, everyone. Raymond Lockhart, Jr., as Cheryl mentioned, I am a case manager supervisor with PMACC. I began at PMACC approximately six years ago. Uh, very interesting experience. Started there as a case manager. After a year and a half, I was promoted to a team leader. A year and a half after that, I was promoted to a supervisor. It's been wonderful. It's been amazing. It has opened a lot of doors for me. As you can see, I'm sitting here right now amongst you. Um, The DNA field is very challenging. We don't only work with individuals who have drug and alcohol disorders, but we work with people who have co-occurring disorders as well. And that in itself is um, every day there's a new experience. You know, there are a lot of people out here who have a lot of challenges, and these challenges are just completely incapacitating people, you know, mentally, physically. And this job, as well as this apprenticeship, has allowed me to enhance my skill set. It has allowed me to be more knowledgeable in the field so that I may be able to go back out and reach those who are challenged and help them to make it through. It's completely an honor to be able to participate in not only the apprenticeship, but in the role of supporting those who a lot of times don't have support. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Raymond. Um, And Anthony Powell, who has served as a mentor at Philadelphia Fight for the Community Health Worker Program. Thank you, Cheryl. Good afternoon, everyone. No, it's a challenge after uh, uh, after lunch, uh, sitting in the panel. So everybody's everyone's sitting here looking start. So let's take one second to just stretch. How about that? Uh, Whoops! There you go. Well, um, again, my name is Anthony Powell, and I'm the reentry center manager um, with Philadelphia Fight for the Institute for Community Justice. Um, we, uh, you heard a little bit about um, our organization from Jay this morning, Philadelphia Fight, um, and I'll talk more specifically about the department that I work for. The Institute for Community Justice is um, a department and a program within Philadelphia Fight that specifically. Um, designed to work with people who've been impacted by mass incarceration and the criminal justice system. Um, Our primary focus um, within that department is kind of three-pronged. We have three different units, um, one of which, um, two of which begin working with individuals behind the walls. Um, That's with our prison linkage specialists um, and our prison prison linkage program that works specifically with folks um, at State Road um, and in the various state uh, correctional institutions to uh, begin um, preparing them and linking them to health care opportunities um, when they come out. 
Um, we do testing behind the wall um, centered around HIV and Hep C. Uh, testing right at State Road five days a week. So we have a team there that's five days a week. Then we have a component, um, which is the prison support component that specifically works with people who need uh, advocacy, um, people who um, need that connection to their families, need that connection to the public defenders, don't have any kind of family connection or friend connections, and finding out what the needs are and advocating for them behind the walls. In both of those units, um, uh, kind of work very close with me and my unit in preparation when they're leaving uh, the prisons and the um, and the correctional institutions to route them into the reentry center where we provide opportunities for and I oversee all of the social service and outreach um, opportunities when they come home or if they're already home. Um, it's been a uh, pleasure. I've been with Philadelphia Fight. This is uh, actually my third year with Philadelphia Fight. So I came in and I kind of inherited uh, this component of the CHW, which was already underway um, and managed by my director, who was um, the manager at that time in my role. So it was a, a great opportunity to inherit uh, uh, this particular apprenticeship and partnership that was um, developed by Philadelphia Fight in partnership with um, District 1199C Training Fund and Temple University, who did uh, the training for the CHWs. Um, um, in that role, um, I had the pleasure, since I've been there, to actually work with um, two individuals that actually have graduated from the program, one of which, uh, Jay, Jay Adams, you heard this morning, um, had the pleasure of working with him and another young lady who graduated from the program. Um, in the time of this particular grant, um, we have... CHWs in not just within ICJ, but within the various health institutions um, um, under the banner of Philadelphia Fight. Um, I can talk more specifically about the work that I did with um, the Institute for Community Justice because um, our particular CHW was rel relatively unique. Um, we find that one of the greatest needs for folks who are coming out of uh, uh, the prison system is a need for health care and workforce, Many, much of what we've been talking about today. And that's kind of our premier uh, two components that we focus on within um, ICJ. My um, role um, um, as managing and working very close when Susan um, oversaw the program was making sure that we provide opportunities, the opportunities needed for our CHWs um, during their apprenticeship um, in preparation to transition into full-time opportunities within Philadelphia Fight. And if I'm not mistaken, and Susan can fact check, fact check me on, uh, or either Cheryl, all of our CHWs that have gone through Philadelphia Fight have been hired as full-time employees um, and have come on staff. I know that we we have four um, just within ICJ that we have hired that are full-time employees, which is inclusive of Jay, and many of them have, tra have transitioned over into other opportunities, one of which are at CHW who graduated, just got promoted into one of our health care systems. I don't know if you're familiar, Susan, but Teresa, who was one of our CHW uh, apprentices, who transitioned as a full-time employee um, in our John Bell Health Center. So it's been this CHW opportunity has been a great opportunity um, for our um, apprentices. They've been exposed, have the opportunity to be exposed to um, um, areas such as outreach. Um, so they go out in the field on behalf of Philadelphia Fight, um, um, conducting health screenings. Um, uh, Jay um, and Teresa both was responsible for on-site health education, which they ran and conducted in partnership with um, um, other health centers such as Jefferson, College of Physicians, who actually come in to do um, educate our folks around um, health education. So that was one of their roles. They do a lot of informal counseling, so they serve on our assessment team, and they do the direct navigation to our clients um, in navigating them either upstairs to our various health centers or if we uh, don't have the capacity to serve them, making that linkage to other health care uh, centers around the um, city, as well as uh, direct patient navigation, um, working, we have partnerships with institutions where we have to, because they're inpatient, we have to bring them into our health center. So that's part of what they do. They'll go and do uh, direct patient escort and a lot of support and advocacy um, 
um, to our Bennett Philly um, um, office. So it's, uh, again, it's been a, a great opportunity in working with uh, the District 1199C. And even though um, the grant has 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 ended, we still do uh, great work with District 1199C and was actually able to work with Temple this, this year to get uh, two more individuals uh, trained and certified in CHW. So we actually sent two more. And one of those individuals just got hired last week full time um, within ICJ um, to, uh, to continue work. So um, that's Philadelphia Fight Thank and the work that we've you. been doing. Thank you. So you can see that in these kinds of fields, it's very easy to see how important the on the job learning is. You know, you can't learn in a classroom how to do this work it you know you need the mentoring and the support on the job those those on the job competencies are key so i'm going to jump right in with the employer side first and i'm going to ask you what i think is a very important question it came up before what are the lessons you've learned that you'd like to share with others in the room and specifically the challenges that you've learned from so so, um, first of all, you need to have buy-in from the top down. If executive leadership aren't invested, it will be a very difficult job for you. It's going to be a hard job anyway, um, but having the uh, support of Judy and Kathy McHale, the CEO of SPIN, certainly made things a lot easier uh, for me. You need to have a people-first culture and value system. You want to be able to um, want to help people. Um, sometimes I, I say that it's like I have five extra children in my life while, we're, while I have apprentices. Not that I'm feeding them. Um, sometimes I am. Um, but it's just the emotional support that they require. Uh, opportunity youth have not always had the same advantages that perhaps you and I have had, and we need to help them with those lessons. Um, and we need to be very, very patient and understanding and help them navigate. So um, you, you, you want to have a people first culture and values. You are going to want to have uh, support from your entire team um, IT helped me a lot, finance helped me a lot, um, HR helps me, and you need somebody like Cheryl and her crew <laughs> to help navigate through all the rules of um, how to uh, register yourself for an apprenticeship. Uh, we certainly would not be as successful as we've been without the training fund. Um, it's been an incredible collaborative effort. Um, we could have done it by ourselves, but I'm really glad that Judy <laughs> didn't say to do that. Uh, it's, been, um, it's been amazing. You want a structured support system in place. Um, Sinead talked about it earlier, about having, having capacity built in within your organization. You need your mentors ready and willing and able before you even think about an apprenticeship. Uh, that has probably been our biggest struggle, mm -hmm. is um, keeping our mentors. Um, in the early childhood apprenticeship program, our mentors get whipped up by the school district, and so we lose them there. Um, in the uh, BHT um, program with the direct support professionals we decided that we decided to do a peer mentor approach um, so the DSPs that work alongside the apprentice um, are the mentors uh, and that's a very new and unique experience for them and it takes a lot of support because many of them haven't really thought about what it's like to be a mentor and have a mentor so having that and, and having some people in your back pocket pocket ready is really important. You have a question? So it's funny that you mentioned that, but this was a conversation I had with Chennai that uh, I should, probably should have asked during the panel. Um, but what compensation do you guys provide in terms of time or money for the mentors who are participating in your apprenticeship? Good question. So um, Cheryl said, 
you need money and they provide us with a stipend so we have a a twelve hundred dollar stipend that we can give to the mentors over the over the 12 month apprenticeship program and what we chose to do was to break it up into quarters so if you provided the mentorship for for a quarter you got some money and then if you did it for the next you got so we I really wanted to give them the $1,200 up front, but Lucy was like, they might not stay. So <laughs> we had to, like, you know, carve it out a little bit. So um, the expectation is that the mentor and apprentice meet once a week, preferably face-to-face, -face, but every other is okay, um, with the other week being email or by telephone. Um, I... I told the mentor and apprentice they had to work it out themselves when they would meet for an hour. Um, the way that the shifts work at SPIN is that it's not always <coughs> the mentor and apprentice are working their shifts together for the full uh, 32 <coughs> hours. Um, if we can get one shift where they work together, that is a beautiful thing. And so a lot of... Um, accommodations of schedule is required so typically it was the mentor would stay late or arrive early an hour early um, during the change of shift where they could have their one hour or they would meet at a separate time and we did compensate both of them um, for that time yes um, a quick related question to the compensation I think Anthony um, to, to the group Anthony you're preaching to the choir when you said that health care is inextricably linked to the career development. So my follow-up question is, how do the, where are the apprentices getting their health care? Are the apprentices getting our health care? Yeah, are, are they covered? Are, are they on yes. a plan? Yeah. They're regular employees. They're typical employees. So an apprentice is actually an employee getting all the benefits of the company. Yeah. Yes. During the time that they're an apprentice, they're, they're, they get the full benefits during their apprentice time, even before they transition over into full-time we could we do not have the financial capability to carve out an apprentice program that's not funded by um, government money we have you have to be hired into a, an available shift and that has been one of our challenges um, is finding a conducive shift that um, supports the school schedule as well um, I also decided early on that the, the apprentice would not do the 12A to 8A shift, the overnight shift. Um, there's not, you're not really going to be able to work on your skills and competencies because everybody's really asleep, right? Um, working in the daytime is when you get more opportunity to build your skills and competencies. But um, these young people don't have cars either, and that's been the other biggest issue, is that they're riding the bus, and I really don't like the idea of, of these young, especially young women, getting on the bus at midnight, but that's what we have to do. Um, if I could give them all a car, I would. Um, but, but so finding a, a home within Philadelphia that's on a bus route with the right kind of schedule, 32 hours, with a strong peer mentor is, uh, is, is not been easy, I must admit. It's been difficult at times, but we figured it out. And then the role the training fund plays is we raise the money for the stipends for the employers. We also um, do all of the documentation so that the employers don't have to do the apprenticeship documentation. We do that for them. Um, and we set it up so that in a multi-employer apprenticeship, all the apprentices are getting their wage increases at the same time, based on the same benchmarks. And those benchmarks could be tied to, in the addictions counselor case of finishing different college, college semesters, or in the DSP, um, I think it's more time-based, where you know, we divided it up based on the number of months. Um, the other thing we've done with our apprenticeship programs is we don't give just one raise in the middle and at the end if we can help it. We ask employers to do maybe three wage increases over the time period of the apprentice. In the early childhood, we've done four. So that there's real wage recognition of the increased competencies 
as the apprentice is going through the apprenticeship program. So the apprentice does not start at spin at the starting rate, which is 13.25. They start at 75% um, of that, that, I think it's about 11 bucks or something. And then every quarter it's gone up uh, 10%. And then when they graduate, they graduate at a higher hourly rate than the starting rate so that they can see that, and, and they deserve every penny of it as well. I mean, it's not a lot, of mon a lot of money, but they deserve every penny of it. So they can see <coughs> some monetary investment and, and um, in that respect as well. So you really do have a true apprentice, right? I mean, they're not even starting at the typical starting salary of, of other people. Now, for incumbents, that's different. So right. do you want to describe how you design the incumbent, Jill? Yes. So for our incumbent um, addictions counselor apprentice, uh, what, what we did was we actually identified five individuals who were in our, they were already working with PMACC case management. They've perfected case management in the sense of perfection. Um, they've been with us for two years or more, so they understand the world of drug and alcohol. They understand the world of um, engagement and recovery supports. So they already had that foundation. Um, when I initially sent out like a feeder to see who would be interested, uh, 30 of our case managers told me that they'd be interested. So it was a whole process to identify who the first five lucky folks would be. Um, and what we did was, uh, with the, the apprenticeship, we had to establish um, pay increases. Because with any apprenticeship, there has to be a wage increase that's established, as Cheryl mentioned. And what, what we did was uh, figured out what's the overall compensation going to be for them to go through this apprenticeship um, and to also go through the classes through Penn State, which is phenomenal. Penn State has been awesome in that aspect. And how are we going to establish the mentor piece and the clinical supervision piece? Because um, as Cheryl mentioned, our um, addictions counselor apprentice, they actually meet criteria to sit for their CADC or CAADC, depending on what their... Uh, degree is when they start the apprenticeship. So uh, what we, you know, an important component of that is making sure that our staff was well equipped to support our apprentice. Um, not only am I a leader in this program, I'm also a mentor. So I, I mentor one of our addictions counselor apprentice. Um, and every uh, senior manager in our unit actually mentors one of our apprentice because we want to ensure that uh, we were giving them the support they needed to, to get what they need at the end. And the end goal is to, to be certified within the state of Pennsylvania. Um, so yeah, there was this wage increase, um, the mentor, which they meet with weekly, and then we have a clinical supervisor. So we kind of did a little bit of overkill <laughs> with um, the support. It's really wraparound support for our apprentice because this is the first of its kind, and we want them to be successful. Uh, you know, I, I, I promised them all that, you know, once you get your certification, we're going to create a job for you. We're going to do all of this great stuff for you, but it's not going to be easy. And Raymond could attest to that, that it, the process itself and the classes have been a challenge, but it, it's a good challenge. And, you know, they began with the end in mind, and they understand that, you know, PMACC case management is going to support them in reaching this goal, and they're, you know, we have plans for them, and we have a vision for them. Um, the other thing that's really important to mention is uh, PMACC case management. We decided to take part in addictions counselor apprenticeship because it, it serves two needs. Um, there's an environmental need. Right now, the opioid epidemic is, is rampant. Um, there's a lot going out on out there in Philadelphia, and we need a workforce that understands the population, that understands the barriers, that understands the engagement that, that's necessary to be successful. And then there's also a workforce need. As our department grows, we need to have folks in-house that we can promote. We, you know, and Cheryl mentioned equity and, and making sure that 
we're doing things in a way that supports who we have in the workforce. This is our way as an employer to, to establish that equity within the workplace and establish a pipeline, I like that word pipeline, a pipeline for our next leaders. Um, Raymond is prime example. I, I sat on in on his initial interview as a case manager, you know, and to see him today as a, a supervisor and he's also going to grad school to get his master's. So he's doing a lot right now. And, you know, to see where he came from and to where he's at, it, it's, it's really empowering for me as an employer. And I know for him and I know for Cheryl, because you, you see that it works. If you're dedicated to putting in the hard work, it works. So Raymond, what, tell us about a week in the life of an apprentice as an addictions <laughs> counselor apprentice. Ah, uh, wow. A lot of work, a lot of work. Um, initially, the program began with us having a class one day during the week, and then it transitioned to two days out the week. Um, that one day of the week for me was difficult because it's been before this apprenticeship began, it was 16 years since I sat in the classroom, and uh, I was not ready. I was not ready at all. A lot of reading, a lot of writing, uh, engaging, with others uh, within the field. And so at first it was, it was, I was kind of awestruck, you know, just trying to manage everything and trying to get myself in the right state of mind in order to be successful while trying to complete the program. As things matriculated, I got more comfortable. Uh, my skill set started to evolve as well as the knowledge. So um, like Jael mentioned, like Cheryl mentioned, it, it's, it's not easy. It's not easy, but the payoff is tremendous. It's, it's tremendous. It's tremendous internally as well as externally. It's tremendous internally because of what I'm receiving for myself, the growth that I am participating in uh, of my own. Uh, externally, I am able to take what I'm obtaining and I'm able to give it back to those who, are, like I mentioned before, who oftentimes don't have support. A lot of people who are challenged with co-occurring disorders, substance misuse, um, they get abandoned by their family, by their friends. Um, difficult for them to find employment. Um, a large population of our demographic that we serve are homeless. So that right there is challenging, um, not just with the work itself, but that um, transference of what they're going through and how it's being perceived and um, adapted by myself. It's, it's, it's very challenging, but the more you stick to it, the more you're committed to your task, the more you're dedicated to the work, it's definitely fruitful, definitely. So in the end, you're gonna have a master's degree and a drug and alcohol certification. That's the goal. Wow. Yes, That's the yes goal. he will. <laughs> That's the goal. That's you know, this, is my, uh, this is my last semester in the CADC course in my first semester in grad school. And, um, <laughs> and Raymond was not going back to school. This, <laughs> this, you know, it's amazing to see that because we've had a lot of conversations, Raymond and I, about him going back to school. And that was something that he was not thinking about at the time. Not at something all. Something clicked. And, you know, he's unstoppable right now. Because I think, but others can, chime in, anyone, you mentioned wraparound. There's a whole sense in the apprenticeship program that, you know, this is something that the organization, the employer is getting behind mm. and providing supports that normally wouldn't exist in the workplace right. for advancement. Um, it's changing the culture of the workplace in some way. Mm -hmm. Um, now, whether every apprenticeship program is like that, I can't speak to. But uh, the, the way we have to run our apprenticeship programs at the training fund involves this because of the populations of employers and people that we interact with on a daily basis. Um, there's a transformation process that I observe from the outside that goes on with the apprentices and also goes on with the employers. It really is truly a transformation process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
I got to ask how you navigated having your apprenticeship program train union and non-union people at the same time. That is something that was it's sort of like a behind the scenes wonky kind of thing, but that is definitely an impediment to growing apprenticeships in New Jersey, uh, mainly because unions have a lot of the facilities that are needed uh, in growing industries. Uh, so I want to know how it worked in general, uh, how you had to convince your unionized employers that this was going to be going the to union. be okay. The union. The union. I'm sorry. The union itself. Then also how you made the non-union employers feel comfortable and safe, you know, with the figuring yes. that they don't want to be union, right? And how you brought them in to realize that they're going to help develop a talent pool that's going to help everybody. Mm -hmm. um, you take a half hour. Yeah. <laughs> You have to build trust and relationships to um, successfully navigate these kinds of orders. And I think that's where most of the problems lie, is that folks in the union, they're, if they're not focused on education, if it's just about union building, then there's a threat to the employer, but our training fund is in that middle ground. We're not the union, we're not the employer. We bring employers and union and stakeholders in the industry together, industry partnership, um, to uh, try to uh, address the issues of that particular industry. It doesn't happen overnight either. You know, we're a 46-year-old organization. I've been there 42 of the 46 years. So I have a lot of relationships all over the city. And um, I try not to be greedy about those. I really try to form as many partnerships as I can. And I think people observe that, you know, where we're opening up partnerships we're not going to benefit at all from it, but it's part of our kind of um, goal, which is to advance the opportunities for folks in the community and advance employers' ability to welcome those individuals into their workplaces. And so for us, when we think about that on a large scale, which is the way I think about it, it makes a whole lot of sense to be able to bridge relationships that normally wouldn't be bridged. You know, I approach PMHCC, they're not a union employer. Um, I don't know if you discussed it. That's up to you to share or not, but some employers will openly say to me, you know, the union's a problem. And no matter what I say, we're not going to get anywhere. But we have so many uh, non-union employers who are, that, that's not their mindset. They're, they're, they feel trusting that if the union is going to, our union or any others is going to organize them, it's not going to be through us. It's going to be because the workers want to organize. That has nothing to do with the education side. Um, so it's been amazing to build these partnerships. Um, I think also what's been great is that the union sits at the table on the apprenticeship committee with non-union employers as well. Rob is here, but he's not in our workshop. I was going to have him be on the panel, but he's getting large. Um, uh, but he represents the union, and he sits on the committee with union and non-union employers. And I think I, I'm speaking for myself, but there's a very open discussion about, you know, the fact that we're all in this together to uh, try to do something the right way. Right. Quick follow-up. Are, are both are the non-union employers paying into the same ERISA fund? No, they're not paying at all. Oh. So here's, here's the ERISA funds is what, when you have a labor management partnership like we have, it's negotiated into the union contracts that the employers pay a percentage of gross payroll into a fund. It's an education trust fund. So I'm the benefits administrator of an education trust fund. There's a firewall between that and our grant raising community efforts. 
what the union employers understand is that they don't have to raise a dime for anything we do because they're already paying us. With the other employers, you know, they, they either have to pay for it fee for service or they have to have funds that are going to pay for it. So that arrangement seems to work just fine. Yeah. You had a question. Um, I'm, I will first, I will commend you for 42 years of partnership building. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the relationships that your organization has seeded and formed and built in the city, um, from what I can tell, seem to have helped evolve sort of an ecosystem, almost yes. a system of peers, which is uh, more than a lot of cities can say. At the very beginning um, of your remarks, Shirley, you ticked through a number of funding opportunities that exist for folks to start apprenticeship programs, um, which is all very exciting. And, one of the things that we think about a lot um, from where I sit is that while well, it's really exciting that this money is going out to develop programs, a thousand disconnected programs or a thousand programs that aren't somehow plugged into or part of systems that already exist in these states and these cities um, may not really solve the problems that we're setting out to solve. So I'm curious, as someone who's been in this work for a long time, if we had a sort of magic wand of some sort to wave, to think about how we could, with in Philadelphia, within the region, within Pennsylvania, nationally, um, develop uh, better coordination between the systems that need to come together to make these programs successful, not just the individual programs, mm -hmm. but just part of the coordinated effort. What would you do or change? Well, let me just say that that's happening in Philadelphia. Um, we've been very lucky to have a mayor who's now in his second term who identified workforce as a, a major priority of his administration. and. Uh, I was actually part of discussions before he got elected um, that with others that um, was pushing this narrative of the need to collaborate systems around workforce um, and integrated workforce and education programs. And so we actually have, I don't know if you've seen it, a strategic plan uh, for workforce in the city. But it's not just on paper. It's very real. And there, I am seeing for the first time a very large school district get on board with having a workforce orientation. I'm seeing um, the community college. It's like steering this big, huge ship in a different direction. But slowly, slowly, they're coming around to seeing the importance of you know, connected education to workforce. And it's not just that they're seeing it, but they're connecting to programs like ours. So our relationship with Penn State, our relationship with Community College for Early Child Care, or Arcadia, um, is also partnered with the school district where we have a whole high school in a pre-apprenticeship that connects to this whole system. I think the problem is that um, if I could wave a magic wand, everybody wants to kind of do their own thing. We're going to just start this new program outside of the great work that already exists. And you know, when money goes on the street like this, I think there's a tendency for people to just want to grab at the money and not really think about, well, how can I use this to really build the capacity of what we have. And that's where I think the issues are. Um, and so I just work really, really hard to try to know as much as I can about what's going on, hear about it even in meetings where you know our staff have talked to another staff person and wow, there's an opportunity that we didn't even know about that we can build on. It's program by program um, that we've created this ecosystem. Um, but I have to say there are a lot of outliers out there you know, that should be part of and joining efforts that already exist. It would just make us a whole lot stronger. Yeah. Cheryl, have you, um, is there a toolkit available? Um, so we, if it's helpful to you, I don't know if it will be, we created, because we have a lot of philanthropic money on the child care side. So we created a toolkit uh, 
for starting the early childhood education program and has many of the same elements as any apprenticeship program, the intermediary role, the mentor role, et cetera. How do you start? What do you do? So it's on our website under uh, publications. Uh, it's called the Replication Toolkit. We're creating a supplement to it now to help employers figure out how to get started. Yeah. Yes. So I, get, I have two question comments. Um, so I think broadly there's been lots of, um, I guess, media around apprenticeships and how much money is going into workforce and apprenticeships. What I have not seen is a realistic kind of campaign to help employers understand what that means when from an employer perspective, mm -hmm. when you hear $9 million, $9 million $150 million, you're thinking that I think some of that will benefit you, but then when approaching a intermediary, it is, oh, but the cost will be. So my question is to how, how do you all work to accurately articulate the resources that have come down federally and statewide and what the benefit to the employer is so that more employers are not taken aback when it's, mm. oh, and it costs a lot of money. Because sure. I've heard that statement a lot in mm -hmm. this, but I've not heard a dollar amount sure. roundabout yet. So that's my one question. And then the second question is, when you think about vulnerable populations and we talk about building capacity, is it the purpose of the apprenticeship to really be a capacity builder or bridging people out of poverty? Because when you speak about the child development associate, most individuals that navigate into that environment quickly find out that the wages are low. Mm -hmm. And with the introduction of income to an already vulnerable population, mm -hmm. you suffer, mm -hmm. there are consequences mm -hmm. that individuals mm -hmm. that participate suffer with the introduction of income. Sure. Sure. So how do you all mitigate that for those populations? So we need about two hours to answer your great questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, in terms of, I'm going to just try to do it briefly. In terms of the first one, yes, apprenticeship's expensive, and the money that's out here, even though it's a lot, it's a drop in the bucket. Um, I think what an intermediary can do um, is to help you to understand what's needed and where you might access those resources. Um, I do believe that employers need support to get started. It is, as we talked about here, it's, it's not a natural thing to figure out how to make this happen. So an intermediary can play a very important role. But I think the other role of the intermediary is with, you know, with our partners is to jointly decide on, well, what resources can we bring to bear? And so our training fund has just really raised millions of dollars in support, literally, in support of apprenticeship. Um, now that there are a lot of other intermediaries that are getting funds, you know, we certainly would be happy to connect employers to those as well. They're usually tied to certain populations or certain industries. So we're tied to both. We have population-based funds as well as industry-based funds. Your second question is the one that we struggle with in terms of our work, because whether it's direct support professional or early child care, they are not high paying jobs. And the benefits cliff when you, know, you start making money and now you're not eligible for benefits applies. And so, first of all, we try to identify the employers that are paying adequate wages because you can get a child care employer paying nine fifty an hour, but you can also get a child care employer paying spin pays thirteen, fourteen dollars an hour. So we work very hard to identify the employers that are going to be the best for our students. And Susan sitting next to you, she and I made many a decision where we said 
you know, to the employer, we really can't work with you. Your wages are just not high enough. And this is not just the essential. Um, you can hear about these parts of the Yeah, when an employer was interested, but then the wages we felt were not, you know what I mean? We, we want to put people with good employers. Mm -hmm. And not only that, to me, if somebody pays way below what I consider to be at least the middle of the market, I get nervous about how do they treat their people, mm -hmm. uh, how are their finances. You know what I mean? Looking at it as a business mm -hmm. may not be a good bet. Yes. As a, as yes. As an educator, one of my concerns is that a lot of people that are being paid to do the um, related technical yes. instruction are adjuncts, and that's not their only job, and they can't keep together a living paying their car. Right. Mm -hmm. figured out a time that worked, and it was great. But you have to clear everything up front. Yeah. So that's another thing that I think that an intermediary is important for, is vetting the whole structure of how the apprenticeship is going to be. So initially, when we looked at the addictions counselor, it was actually Jael who brought to us, to a meeting that was happening, that she thought Penn State would be a good partner. Then we had to vet Penn State because we, even though they had a um, certificate program for addictions counselor, it didn't necessarily translate into qualifying to take the exam. Mm -hmm. And so they had to make some changes for the apprenticeship program, which was good for them too, to ensure that this certificate program they had would be meaningful to the apprentices. So they actually made those changes as a result of our negotiations with them. So you have leverage when you have multiple employers. That's why I'm saying you can actually do an industry intervention. You have multiple employers. You can impact the post-secondary. You can impact um, uh, even uh, the regulatory organizations, because right now in Pennsylvania, the child care organizations are actually putting pressure now on to raise the wages of the child care, as, partly as a result of this apprenticeship program. So um, I think that there's so many impacts that you can have with an apprenticeship program that goes way beyond an individual employer or an individual apprentice. We're just about at time. One, I'd like everybody on the panel, and I'm sorry, Anthony, you haven't gotten a chance to speak That's that much, helpful. but if you could, starting with Anthony, maybe one thing you'd like to leave the audience with. Um, well, one of the things is I, I would definitely say with um, um, our population that, um, oh, sure. Okay, there you go. One of the things I would say with our population is that um, we find that apprentice, apprentice opportunities um, work best for folks who are coming home out of incarceration or who have criminal records um, only because of their um, um, immediate needs and what they look for around instant gratification when they're coming home. Um, and so we've been working very close with our workforce uh, development team in identifying opportuni training opportunities that, are, that will give our population credentialing um, opportunities uh, to make a livable wage. And so I would say um, apprenticeship 
programs uh, extremely work for the population that we work for, as opposed to us introducing them to um, educational opportunities because of their needs um, um, within um, kind of the criminal justice system. So that's what I will leave you with. Okay. Raymond? Well, <clears throat> I believe in the apprenticeship program. It affords uh, individual to, like Anthony mentioned, to earn credentials. Um, there are a lot of individuals, myself included, who um, made bad decisions in life. And the credential helps to move you along. It helps to provide you an opportunity to, to a certain degree, level the playing field. It gives an individual purpose. It gives them an opportunity to grow, learn, to share, to engage and meet new individuals um, within that same field for myself. Um, the partnership between PMACC, 1199C, and Penn State, um, that's unheard of to me. You have three completely separate entities coming together as one with a common goal. I think that is invaluable within itself. If there's anyone who has an opportunity or the availability to get an apprenticeship program within their organization, it would only help that organization to grow. It will help those who are employed by that organization to enhance themselves, as I mentioned before, internally as well as externally. Um, it's just a great idea. There is um, stipends available. Uh, for us, I'm not sure if um, other organizations, but the cost is free. And that right there is motivating. So I can't no say debt. anything. No student debt. No student debt at all. You know, um, it's college experience, this field experience. Um, it's, it's an amazing, it's an amazing opportunity an amazing opportunity, and if you are able to provide that opportunity for others, then I would say, please, please do so. So um, with respect to just health care and behavioral health and um, physical health as it relates to, you know, our current state of the, our community, um, as an employer, I, I understand that and realize that um, our organization needs to be up to, you know, to, up to the times, really. Um, you know, within the state of Pennsylvania, um, the integrated uh, care plans and, and the transition from um, these silos where, you know, addictions here, physical health is here, um, intellectual disabilities is here, it, it's long gone. Mm -hmm. um, there's a transition where everything is being addressed together and concurrently because you can't address addiction and not address the mental health component. And we need our staff, and as an employer, I understand that our staff need to be equipped to uh, withhold these changes within, you know, that our, our the, the policies and and um, the physical health and, and, the, and the insurance and the expectations that they have for providers. So um, the apprenticeship is a really unique and interesting way to provide those resources and that connection that is so necessary for the change in the behavioral health field and the physical health field. So it's really important that, you know, if you're going into the apprenticeship, you understand what your platform is and you understand what, you know, what it is that you can do and where the regulations are going so that you're transitioning along with the uh, regulators. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, apprenticeships are hard work. I won't say that again, but the apprenticeships are hard work, but they also really put you in a position or a playing field to, to to be at the top of your industry. SPIN's uh, motto is to support people <coughs> with uh, developmental disabilities and autism to live a life of possibility. So that's our goal every day, right? Um, 
the apprenticeship program by having that at spin we're also helping people that perhaps would be on a different road to live a life of possibilities and why would you not want to be a part of that um that journey for that person and and to be able to give them a, a leg up and a lift up um there's no reason why you shouldn't do it and there's tons of reasons why you should mm -hmm. thank you for being such a great audience thank you so much